Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. A new research report conducted by Pew Research Center is focusing on India's population and revolves around religious identity, nationalism, and religious tolerance. The report, which is based on just under 30,000 interviews with Indian adults, was conducted between 2019 and 2020. It was conducted in 17 languages and covers nearly all of India's 28 states and eight union territories. Some of the key findings for this report include that Indians value religious tolerance, although they prefer to live religiously segregated lives. Two-thirds of Hindus believe that Hindu women or men shouldn't be marrying into other religious communities. For many Hindus, national identity, religion, and language are closely connected. 64% of Hindus believe that it is important to be Hindu in order to be truly Indian, while 80% also say it is very important to speak Hindi to be truly Indian. Amongst Hindus, views of national identity go hand in hand with politics. The ruling party, Ajanta Party, has great support from Hindus who closely associate their religious identity and the Hindi language with being truly Indian. To discuss this survey and their findings, we are joined by Suhag Shukla. Suhag Shukla is the co-founder and executive director at Hindu American Foundation. She has a BA in religion and JD from the University of Florida. She's a strong advocate of human rights and religious freedom. Thank you for joining us today, Suhag. Thank you for having me. Right off the bat, I guess I want to ask you, was there any findings in the research study that surprised you? Oh, a lot. You know, it's, I think, 233 pages, so there's a lot to digest. And, you know, the thing about statistics is that you can do a quick read through, but then how do different statistics maybe inform other statistics? Uh, so oftentimes these surveys require a first read, a second read, sometimes even a third read. But I'd say overall, the story is largely one that reflects not the headlines of the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR or BBC when it mm -hmm. comes to religion in India. Um, it reflects far more the stories that I've experienced on my frequent visits back, um, as well as the experiences of my friends and family who live there. Um, to me, uh, India has always been a country where religious pluralism and diversity and side-by-side -side coexistence is a way of life, and that's exactly what I think the um, Pew Research uh, survey has found. They describe it as a patchwork, um, and I think that that's mm. a very apt uh, description of interreligious relations in India. The study found that while majority of Indians across all six major religious groups valued religious tolerance, the majority of individuals interviewed also advocated for segregation based on religious lines and advocated against interfaith marriage. Why do you think that Indians prefer to live and marry amongst people of their own faith and segregated from others? Yeah, I think that um, I don't see those statistics or even that um, finding as any different from any other human society. We as humans are attracted to people who are like us, um, whether and when it comes to marriage and things like that, uh, people want are thinking, at least a lot of people are thinking about future generations, child rearing, um, wanting to have a marriage succeed, and many times having commonalities, having a shared culture, especially things like religion that might inform day-to-day -day interactions uh, are important. So, you know, to see that um, Indians as a whole prefer to marry within their own is probably not all that different from from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I think maybe where things are a little bit different um, are the living situation. And, you know, I think that, you know, oftentimes for the United States, and I don't know how it is in Canada, but we're described as a melting pot. And, you know, even though the United States is oftentimes called a melting pot, I've always actually used the analogy of a salad. Uh, we have tomatoes, we have carrots, we have lettuce or spinach or whatever. And the thing that kind of brings it all together is a good dressing. And maybe you can look to like the American dream or, you know, shared American values in, in democracy, in secularism and um, in, you know, equality and justice. Maybe those are all the things that kind of hold it all together. So in that sense, um, in the United States, sure, 
people say melting pot, but we do have our little Italy's. We do have our uh, Chinatowns and little Korea, little Saigon, Greek town. I mean, so many examples of where people have built communities and chosen to live um, together amongst their own. So, you know, maybe we see that in a more, it, maybe it appears more exaggerated in India, but I think we need to keep in context that it's, first of all, a far older civilization as opposed to, say, the United States. Um, second is geographically, you're looking at a far more densely populated region. Um, so, you know, whether the Western melting pot formula is a one size fits all, I would challenge that presumption. So even a word like segregation, I think, carries um, a lot of uh, judgment with it. And, and Pew Research does value itself or pride itself on being nonpartisan. So in some sense, that word, maybe if you're just looking at it as a word, um, isn't that loaded. But I think in the context of the United States, it certainly has because this country has had a long history of, of segregation, um, specifically impacting um, the African-American community. Um, that said, uh, I think that if this side-by-side -side living in India is happening as a result of mutual preference, um, out of mutual respect, and coming from a place of preference as opposed to, say, prejudice and discrimination. I think that just shows us that's what's um, worked in India. Um, and I think that we find that model actually far more um, across the globe where you have multi-ethnic and uh, multi-religious societies living side by side. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, you would say that religious tolerance and religious-based segregation can exist simultaneously? I mean, I think we see it. I think we see it in India um, in that sense that um, there, you know, on the whole, you saw that um, I think I can pull up the, the percentages exactly, but it was something like 80% um, of every religious community in India saying that they're free to practice religion. And the difference mm -hmm. between Hindus and Muslims was just two percentage points, 80% said uh, across religions that respecting other religions is important in general. And 84% of all Indians said that respecting other religions is very important to being Indian. And 65% of both Hindus and Muslims uh, reported or, or responded that communal violence um, does occur. And it's, it's a big, um, that if, if communal violence occurs, that it's a big concern. So I think looking at all of these statistics together, again, to my first point, that uh, we have to look at how a lot of these questions might be interrelated mm -hmm. and uh, where you have a story where the vast majority of people personally value respecting other religions as a whole for a healthy Indian society, value uh, religious respecting other religions, you know, I think that all of those things need to be looked at um, holistically. So speaking of percentages, um, I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions that are based on the study itself. So another thing that we found from the study was that India's caste system continues to fracture society. So for example, 70% of Indians said that most or all of their friends share their same caste. 64% of Indians say it is very important to stop women from their respective communities from marrying into other castes. And 62% said that it is very important to stop men from doing the same. So what do you think right. about that? So, um, you know, I have read uh, those sections and I think that there's a larger story to be told there. Um, you know, caste is one of these things that, you know, in the Indian context, it's a legal fiction in terms of its uh, at least the way the survey asked the questions in terms of distinguishing between scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and other backward castes, and then what they categorized as general castes. So what we find, um, I think, if I recall correctly, and I'm not an expert on the survey, I'm just a reader like you know everyone else outside of the Pew Research team, but um, I think the regardless of religion, um, most said that they had this preference. So whether it's religious preference or caste preference, I think that we saw that across the board. Uh, 
I think that what a lot of Westerners may not know is that a lot of the traditions, um, you know, that, that each community or, or caste, whatever we want to call it, have sometimes shared origin legends, have shared histories, have shared deity traditions, might have certain festivals and rites that they, um, that they celebrate. And um, they might have a shared occupation. I mean, there's a number of things that might um, kind of provide a cohesiveness within the larger religious identity that's more community-based. So I suppose that's not surprising. Um, I think what's important to also note that 80% of all Indians, regardless of their caste, um, reported that they had not personally faced discrimination based on caste in the year prior to taking Mm -hmm. the survey. So again, um, I think that we could probably do a deeper dive um, into the the findings, but what exactly caste is outside of these, you know, two kind of broad um, categories of of the administrative um, designations and general, we don't really kind of get Mm -hmm. an idea from the survey. Yeah. Speaking of sharing, despite the differences between Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains, this report found that there were also some shared religious practices and beliefs. These included wearing a bindi among Sikh, Christian, and Hindu women, and the belief in karma amongst Muslim, Hindu, and Christians. Moreover, 7% of Indian Hindus celebrate Eid, and 17% celebrate Christmas. So in your opinion, what does this say about Indian society? I think it says exactly what I've seen. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story of my husband's ancestral town. My in-laws um, had the honor of housing the local goddess, um, uh, the Murti, in their home while a new temple was being constructed. Oh, wow. And, um, and their house helper, um, uh, who happened to be a Muslim, um, took on the same vrat that my <laughs> aunt-in-law did uh, because she had such deep devotion for the goddess. Uh, another another story um, is in my father's ancestral town. I was born and raised in the United States, but recently we had a chance as a family to go back and our family sponsors a Ayurvedic dental uh, tooth removal camp. And so the camp was hosted in the local temple and uh, you saw lining up the town's Christians and Muslims to not only have this treatment done, um, which was there uh, as a service uh, for the community, for anyone who had dental ailments and um, didn't have necessarily the means to take care of them. But I also noticed that as they entered, there was a little bit of a bowing because we were in a temple, um, immense uh, respect given to the space um, and a third story I'll give is in my mother's ancestral village, uh, for instance, when there is a marriage procession for either of the communities, the band kind of quiets down as they're going past one another's um, houses of worship. So syncretism and um, side by side peaceful coexistence, I think, has been um, the story of India largely. That's not to deny that there are incidents of tension and violence, uh, but I really did find very surprising um, some of the statistics. Um, you know, Indian Christians, 54% believing in karma, 29% believing in reincarnation, and Muslims, as you mentioned, 77%. That was even with Hindus uh, believing in karma, yeah. 27% believing in reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they reflect um, what so many of us see on our visits back or for people who live there well i've lived here most of my life and i feel like i only hear stories like these from people like you who have been there and are kind of helping around i haven't been back in a very long time so thank you for sharing those that was that actually makes my heart very happy (laughs) to even just to hear things that like people are doing that and indian society is still coming it's still moving forward i think so i you know the the media coverage especially in the last couple years has been just so vitriolic and uh, you know I know that oftentimes people say that good news isn't news and only bad news it uh, makes uh, makes the headlines and allows people to read but I think there's a big difference here there's a matter of accuracy that we have Mm -hmm. not been seeing and Mm -hmm. uh, you know when you have political polarization 
coming to heads with mistrust of the media. I think the only uh, things that get harmed are us as citizens and democracy as a viable uh, governing structure. We have to have accurate information. We have to have trust in our media that they are speaking truth to power. And, um, and so I hope that we see more coverage of this Pew Research survey, or at least the survey results informing mm -hmm. how the story of India is told. You mentioned melting pot earlier. So the report stated, and I quote, while people in some countries may aspire to create a melting pot of different religious identities, many Indians seem to prefer a country more like a patchwork fabric with clear lines between groups. What do you think are the benefits of a country which is more like patchwork fabric versus about a country which is more like a melting pot? You know, I think that we really need to look at the histories um, the cultural context of any country. Uh, as an American, I have seen my own government uh, going to other countries and trying to force fit um, an American brand of democracy or an American brand of, you know, coexistence on places where it may not necessarily fit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's incumbent upon local communities to figure out what works for them. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are either going to benefit from it or pay the price. Speaking of an overall general thing, do you think that this study, which is dealing with religions in India, was needed? Uh, that's a judgment call that I haven't really thought about. Mm -hmm. I think that information like this is important for us to have because uh, data should be driving policy. Um, data should be driving um, diplomacy and um, data I think is helpful in also meeting the needs of our societies. Um, mm -hmm. We need to have governments that are, are you know, responsive, especially a democracy, um, is responsive to the needs and uh, desires of, of its population. Mm -hmm. Now surveys can also be uh, rife with <laughs> with problems, you know, uh, yeah. how are the questions asked, uh, for instance, and, and especially for something as complex as religion. I think that, um, you know, no survey is going to be perfect in that end. And I'll give you one example. Um, the question on yoga, for instance, you know, uh, I think other surveys have found that 11% of Americans practice yoga. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when we're looking at that sort of statistic, what people are thinking of yoga is just asana. And asana alone is not yoga. This is something that the Hindu American Foundation has been at the forefront of in terms of educating the global public about what yoga is. Mm -hmm. Yoga is a spiritual discipline that might be a path of service, that might be a path of devotion, it might be a path of knowledge seeking, um, or it might be a path of, uh, of meditation. And so yoga is not just something that happens on the mat. So when you have questions like, do you practice asana? Um, and you get, I think the response was 13%. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the conclusion from that is most Indians don't practice yoga because there was another question about meditation, for instance, where I think half of adults reported, you know, meditating. I don't know if it was on yeah. a week basis or daily basis, but all of these things, when you take a kind of myopic view, and I don't, maybe not myopic, well, myopic or even Abrahamic view towards religions, mm -hmm. where things like church attendance are the defining factor, or the number of times you uh, practice, or maybe not the defining factor, but part of the definition, or the number of times you uh, pray a day, those types of questions are ill-fitted, I think, for mm -hmm. the Dharmic traditions that tend to be more uh, open, um, that have uh, so much inherent diversity and religious freedom in terms mm -hmm. of leaving it to the individual on how they're going to live out their spiritual life. So speaking of these questions, if you were to personally conduct some sort of or this kind of similar study, um, what kind of questions would you ask or would you have framed them differently? Would you have asked more questions or additional questions? I think that, yeah, I probably would have framed the words differently mm -hmm. um, or rather the questions differently, especially when it comes to yoga, maybe getting into more like ethical values um, that are part of a tradition uh, would be helpful. And open-ended questions are always good so that you can get uh, 
to really uh, drill down into what is meant. Uh, I have personal experience with not conduct, well, they were conducting surveys, but they weren't a statistical survey. They were more um, qualitative as opposed mm -hmm. to quantitative. My husband runs a, a medical, a surgical workshop in India, and we were trying to get to the psychological well-being of parents and children. And as I was going through these survey questions, even in translation, that's another area where, um, you know, things can get a little bit dif difficult because each language is different. So when I was asking questions, um, for example, about extremely important, very important, important, not important, not important at all, those types of scales are actually very difficult, I found at least, in translating them to the parents that I was talking to because the, you know, it's just different contexts and the way that different cultures uh, use language mm -hmm. um, to emphasize things that are important to them. So, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a professional survey taker. I would have to think a little bit more about how I might ask the questions, but I think I would take definitely a more broad approach um, mm -hmm. to questions about religion and definitely an open approach. And so that's, I think the best way um, to approach it. And also really, um, pulling in experts from the tradition, um, whether it's scholarly or I think people who are in the in those communities, um, such as swamis or um, uh, other acharyas and pandits um, or, you know, temple presidents or whatever it might be, really getting to hear from the stakeholders of how religious life looks mm -hmm. um, on the ground. And maybe that's something that Pew did. Uh, but I, I, I believe they did take some uh, qualitative um, questions, uh, but I don't know if those responses have been um, published. Yeah. Uh, do you believe Pew missed anything in the study that you would have preferred or liked to see in it? I will reserve my judgment on that until I have maybe my third reading. It's always easy Fair when enough. you're doing something to um, look for the gaps. It's a whole different kind of read um, to look for the, well rather, look for errors or you know mm -hmm. room for improvement it's a bit a bigger project i think to look for yeah. gaps i feel like every time <laughs> i read it i was learning something new every single time i read it so absolutely it was, yeah absolutely it was, like, it was a good study in your opinion what should people be taking away from this study uh if there's one take home is read the survey uh, look for yourself. I mean, you know, even if you're just looking at the high level findings, I think they're fascinating and contrast them. Use those as a, a starting point or, or a, a foundation or a lens through which you continue to read the headlines on India. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it can really help individuals who are curious about India or are observers of India to um, have some you know, the closest to scientifically validated data that we're, that's out there, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to better understand uh, the, the real story of India. What kind of implications, if any, does this study have on your organization? I think that, you know, our work is to educate the media, educate policymakers, and educate the public at large about Hindus and Hinduism. So obviously the story of India plays a large part in that, uh, both as kind of the sacred geography um, from which the Hindu tradition um, emerged, as well as the vast majority of Hindus uh, being in India, and even in the diaspora, the vast majority of in, uh, Hindus being of Indian origin. Mm -hmm. So having this sort of uh, data I think is um, really important for our organization um, in order to educate people proactively as well as dispel stereotypes and misinformation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's absolutely fair enough. Thank you for joining me today, Sohaga. It was great meeting with you. Likewise, thanks for having me. Thank you all for tuning in. You're watching the International News Channel. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to keep up to date with our latest videos. Until next time, I am Simone Ivani.